Well, what can we say, men? <clears throat> God has already said to us enough for us to go home and let God deal with us. He's already said enough. <clears throat> You know, it's very interesting to me to sit in each one of these services. I don't know if you saw and sensed what I did. Thank you, my brother. But I saw God's beautiful balance this morning and this evening. When I stood up here to share with the sisters, I faced a whole group of ladies whose hearts were broken, submissive, open, and wanting to hear. And that corporate expression broke my heart. It broke my heart. Now all of us men are up here. And it's a bit different, you know. We're men. God made us different. Yes, we're here. We want to do God's will. But there's a strength here. There's a solid strength here. That is right. That is good. And oh, how beautiful it is when God can blend together in a husband and a wife in a home that soft, submissive spirit and that strong humility of man and wife to carry out the building of his kingdom upon the earth is beautiful to behold and see and sense them both from morning to evening this evening I want to bring the message on this first message here where are the men <clears throat> Ezekiel said in Ezekiel 22 and verse 30, I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land. But I found none. Yes, God needs men. As the prose clearly declares, all through the pages of the Bible, we find the Lord looking for a man or men. All through the pages of the Bible, we find the Lord doing that. He has ordained it that he <clears throat> would work through men to lead his people. The exciting part of all this is that God is no respecter of persons. He will use anyone who is willing to make themselves usable and available. Amen. Praise the Lord. I think all of us know, all of us who know anything about church history would agree that the early church was filled with men Godly men who were leaders. In those early days of God's glorious power, the church did not lack for men. It was as was prophesied in Psalm 68 verse 11, when the presence of God will come. The Lord gave the word and great was the company of those that published it. This word company means army. Picture it, brethren, a whole army of men prophesying. That's what was prophesied in Psalm 68, verse 11, that the coming of the Holy Ghost would raise up a whole army of men who preach and prophesy in the power of the Holy Ghost. My! What an effect that would have on every one of our homes. Amen, brethren? 
Forget about Jerusalem. Forget about turning Jerusalem upside down. What will the effect be upon our homes? That is exactly the way it was in the days of the early church. God must send revival and set this whole thing back straight again. Yes, God needs men, lots of men dedicated who will deny themselves and serve their God. It is also evident in the scripture that God is searching for these men. His eyes go to and fro throughout the whole earth, seeking men with upright hearts. The title of this message, Where Are the Men? This title is more than a question, dear brothers, tonight. It is a question given as a clarion call to men. It is given as a man who has just stumbled on the opportunity of a lifetime and he can't find anybody to help him do it. Where, oh where, are the men? In light of the promise of the Spirit, in light of the promises of God in the Bible, where, oh where, Lord, where are these men? who will walk through these beautiful doors of opportunity that have been opened before us. The title also fits Christ's evaluation very clearly. When he was on the earth, he said, The harvest is great, but the laborers are few. <clears throat> this little phrase, where are the men? This thing has become a household phrase. In many, many of our homes. A household phrase. It comes up from time to time as discussions are made. As a, as a, as a, uh, as a discussion on Sunday afternoon opens up and, and maybe somebody shares about a beautiful opportunity and there's no one there to fill it. All of a sudden you'll hear out of the silence that usually comes when you realize there's nobody to fill it. And somebody says... Where are the men? Where are the men to walk through these open doors? The early church was filled with men, godly men. Paul said to Timothy, The things which thou hast heard of me, the same commit thou also to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. This was Paul. Paul speaking in the context of the early church could confidently say to Timothy, speaking of four generations of men, he being the first, Timothy being the second, saying, I want you to find faithful men to give this to, that they may also give it to other men after them. Oh, my dear brethren, this is God's method of continuing on the, the role of leadership in the church and in the home. God needs men, no question about it. I want to share just a little bit of the reason why and where the burden for this message came from. It's 23 years ago now that I was in a church in Morden, Manitoba. I was near Morden, Manitoba not long ago when there were tent meetings up there in Manitoba. And I remembered this is the place where those two messages were born long before I knew how important they were. The hidden woman and where are the men? Those two messages. When I was there in Morden, Manitoba, serving, pouring water on the hands of Lou and Ralph Cetera, who were having revival meetings, they told me, we're going to have a ladies' meeting and we'd like you to speak to the ladies. I never spoke to ladies before. I didn't know what that was all about, but I told them, okay, if you want me to speak to the ladies, I'll speak to the ladies. I went to the meeting that evening. It was a Tuesday night. There were 400 ladies in that meeting. And when I got up behind the pulpit, I faced what I faced this morning. That's what I stood before. These were ladies who had been in three weeks of revival meetings. Their hearts were broken. Their hearts were open. They wanted the right things. They were ripe for anything that I had to say. 
And that's, I stood before these ladies and it shocked me. I spoke to the ladies on the power of a submissive spirit. I don't know where I get the courage to speak on such a thing in the setting that I was in because it was a very different setting than where I am now. But that's what God led me to speak on. At the, at the end, I gave an invitation and 150 ladies flooded in every corner of the front, down every aisle. They came, they fell on their faces, they wept, they wailed, they, they, they just broke their hearts. And I just stood there in awe at what God was doing. After the meeting was over, I caught many of their tears as they opened up their hearts to me and confessed their need that they were not in their place, but they didn't know what their place was. And what do we do about our husband? My husband is not a spiritual leader. My husband doesn't want to go the right way. How do I follow him? And all these questions came out on me when I challenged those dear ladies to get underneath the authority of their husbands. Two days later, we had a men's meeting in the same setting, in the midst of the same revival that was going on. We had a men's meeting and the men's meeting was just like the ladies meeting. All the men showed up there. There was a message given that related right where the men were at, their responsibilities, what God is saying to them. It was a beautiful message. It surely could have reached down into the hearts of those men. But when the invitation was given, only three men went forward and I sat in that meeting remembering all that I had experienced just a couple of evenings before, remembering all the tears that I caught. And there was the first time that the cry came up out of my heart and my heart said, Oh God, where are the men? Why aren't these men on their faces, Lord, weeping their hearts out? Why is it that their wives are and they are not? <clears throat> Some time ago, I spoke in a church. Sorry about that. I spoke in a church and I shared. It was a group. Men and women all there. And I shared a message along the lines of the place of the ladies and the sisters in the church and, and their place in relation to their husbands and all of that. I shared this message. No invitation was given, but in this particular church service, as is often our custom here also, we open it up for anybody who wanted to testify or confess at the end. We stood for nearly 30 minutes as the ladies stood one after another, broke their heart, opened up their heart, and confessed their needs of getting in their place and being who they're supposed to be in the struggles that they were facing. A couple of days later, a message was given to the men. Not one response. Not one response. And again, my heart rose up and said, Oh God, where are these men? Lord, what is wrong? What is wrong, Father, that we don't have any men? There are many times when Jackie and I are in places here and there, visiting, sharing, or maybe in a home, and uh, visiting with new people that we meet, and we will sit there in the, in the living room, and, and it isn't always this way, but many times, Especially in the past, we would sit there and the ladies would just be full of questions and they would have lots of things to say and there sat a husband kind of like a bump there on the couch. And so many times we would drive away from that place and she would look at me and I would look at her and we'd both say almost the same words at the same time. Where are the men? Where are the men? Oh, there were men in the room. Yes, they were there. But... They were not there. Their hearts were not there. They were not in tune with what was going on. They weren't burdened about the things of the Spirit of God. They were not there. I think about the potential of a message like this and the potential of, of the meetings that we're having all this week when I think about all you men and what God could do through you if you would get a hold of God and I mean get a hold of Him in such a way that this does not wear off in a week or two 
I think of the tremendous potential that could come uh, out of meetings like this and a message like this. It just thrills my heart. You have the opportunity to affect three or four generations of leaders, dear men. Three or four generations of leaders. Do you know, dear brethren, that leaders raise up leaders? Do you know that? David said some amazing words about leaders in 2 Samuel chapter 23, verse 2 through 4. He said these words, they're powerful. The Spirit of the Lord spake by me, he said. His word was in my tongue. And then David goes on and gives the effect. I'm sorry. His word was in my tongue and then he said these words. He gives what the Spirit of God said to him. Words about leadership. He that ruleth over men must be just ruling in the fear of God. Then David gives the effect of this kind of anointed leadership in such beautiful, descriptive words. It's worthy for every father to memorize them and long for the day when his leadership has this kind of effect. He says, this leader, this anointed leadership, he shall be as the light of the morning when the sun ariseth, even a morning without any clouds. He shall be as the tender grass springing out of the earth by clear shining after rain. And what I get as I read these verses, I understand that God is saying the influence of godly leadership is just like a beautiful sunrise coming up onto the world after there's been rain in the night. Everything is covered with water. The sun is glistening down upon everything in the world and everything is growing. And that is a beautiful picture of leadership. True, biblical, godly leadership has a mysterious influence on everything around it and everything is growing. There were days in the history of Israel when the nation was full of leaders. Have you ever read the list of David's mighty men? This list follows the words that I just read you. He gives us clear principles of godly leadership, brethren. And then he gives us an example of his mighty men who were raised up by his leadership. All in the same chapter. Beautiful. Leaders produce leaders. This principle works whether it is a father and his sons or a leader and his men. This is the reason why... There were so many leaders in the nation of Israel at one time because the men of Israel were leaders and their sons grew up to be leaders and their servants also became leaders. Think of it, brethren. There are two ways that this dearth, this lack of leadership can be changed. First of all, we need a heaven sent revival. Just like in days of old, when the Spirit of God is poured out upon men, then we will have an abundance of leaders. This would stem the tide, no doubt. <clears throat> the second way is a bit closer to home for each and every one of us. And that is this. We men need to have a personal revival in our own hearts and take our places as anointed leaders in our homes. This will produce a whole generation of young men who are leaders. This is how it works, brethren. You see, when a boy grows up in a home where father is a godly anointed leader, not a dictator, not some domineering fella, I'm talking about an anointed godly leader. 
When a boy grows up in that, guess what? He catches the spirit of leadership from his father. Remember? Remember that innocent, those innocent little children? Here's this innocent little boy or boys growing up in your house. And you, as a godly leader, in the spirit of true biblical leadership, you lead your home. That little boy is picking that up all the time he's in the house. He's getting bigger. He's watching you. He's looking at you and saying, he's the best papa in the whole wide world. I want to be like him someday. He's watching you. He's tracking you. Every move you make, he's following it. As he grows up, he continues to sit there and soak in the leadership of a godly father. And guess what? As he begins to grow and develop into a young man, he is a leader. He is a leader. Leaders produce leaders. He grows up at dad's feet and catches leadership from him. And this is something that each and every one of us men can do. We can do that. Brethren, we can do it. <clears throat> Many, many men, and I thank God for this, but many men are aspiring to the work of God, and that's beautiful, and we want that. But the biggest gap is in the home. The biggest gap is in the home. It's not so difficult to get a man to go out, even among us right here, to go out and uh, knock on some doors or tell somebody about Christ or preach a sermon on the street corner. But oh, for men to be leaders in the home, in the thick and the thin, in the day in and the day out, in the everyday part of life, there is where our weak spot is, brethren. We have to get this right or all the rest of God's work will not come out right. It will not come out right. Nothing, there is no greater gift that you as men can give to the church of the next generation than a bunch of young men that rose up underneath your godly leadership in your home. And they rose up. Nay, you didn't have to sit them down and say, okay, my son, leadership 101. No, he's been soaking in the atmosphere of your godly leadership from the time that he was a little fella. Nothing would bless the church more than for you to pass that on as you go on. Amen. God's will for you men. And let me just say this before I move on. One more thing on my heart. So many times, so many times the ministers, they sit in a minister's meeting as we brood over this situation or this one or this one. And, and that's something that ministers do when we gather together. We, we, we fuss over the flock. We look at the needs. We brood over the, the lambs and some of the struggles they're having. But so many times in those meetings, the word comes up again and again. Where are the fathers? Why isn't the father in tune to this? Why isn't he awake enough to see this? Why must we have to come in and do this? Where is this father at? Why is he not more alert than this? This comes up all the time. Oh, my dear brothers, my brothers, what are we going to do? When are we going to be awake enough to realize what's going on in our homes? God's will for you men, it is his will that you be mature men, that is, men who walk with God and know how to listen to His voice and do what He says. God's will for you men is to find a place of financial stability, eliminating all the pressures in life so you can be financially free, so you can be time free, so you can serve God. That's God's will. It's God's will for men to be loving husbands who come alongside and nurture their happy wives into bright and radiant wives, which we'll say more about tomorrow. And it's God's will for men to be wise fathers who guide their families in the right path. Dear brethren, this is dynamic leadership right there. If you've got a bunch of men that'll do that, you've got more leaders and you know what to do with in your church and you know I'm telling the truth. <clears throat> if we would just lay a hold of what we are hearing, we would have a strong church, a mighty church. And you say, my brother, the standard is too high. Well, did you ever look at the qualifications for leaders in First Timothy? 
That is exactly the standard that God lays out. God says, you make leaders out of men who have developed in all of these areas and yea, even more. It is God's will that he work in each one of our hearts in such a way that yea, someday, whether we are selected or not, we are ready to be selected to lead the church. I do not believe in the early church there were two or three men who were ordainable and everybody else was sitting there waiting to grow up. I don't believe that. That is the curse of this age that we are living in. That you can hardly find a leader. Maybe one every now and then. That is not God's will. It wasn't that way in the early church and it shouldn't be that way now. But we need the Holy Ghost. That's what we need. <clears throat> There's grace enough, brethren. It should be normal that the church would be filled with men of God. It should be normal that the church would be filled with prophets and teachers and exhorters and evangelists and men of wisdom and leaders, not a few. It's the will of God. It should be normal in the church that the sisters have a spiritual husband. It should be normal in the church that every family have a, have, and every mom have a godly daddy in their home. It should be normal that it be that way. It should be normal that all the children have a papa that brought a hot word from the Lord this morning in family devotions. Amen. It should be normal. God is going there, my brethren. That's where God is moving us. All the things, all the things that God has said to us this week, that is exactly where God is moving us. We need to open up our hearts and let Him take us as far as He will. That's God's will. Where are the men? Where are the men? The Spirit of God is calling men to rise up and take a hold of God and get the grace and face the responsibility. Did you see that order there? Rise up, get a hold of God, get the grace you need, and then fulfill your responsibilities. That's what God is calling us to do. I want you to notice also, brethren, God honors men. We're not always honorable. But God honors men. From creation, God established His order. And He established His orders that men would lead out. <clears throat> Most of the time, God leads through men in, in, in the examples in the Bible. All through the Bible, you see men. Even the context of the Bible is written to men. Written to men. It's not that God is dishonoring women. He has just set his things in order and according to God's heart and God's plan, men will be the leaders. Too much is given, much is also required. Amen? Much is also required. Let's turn to uh, Isaiah. I want to read in Isaiah chapter 3 just a little bit here. Isaiah, I believe, has an answer to the plague that we're facing I believe that Isaiah has an answer to the plague that we're facing. Chapter 3, verse 1 through 8. <clears throat> Behold, the Lord, the Lord of hosts, doth take away from Jerusalem and from Judah the stay and the staff the whole stay of bread and the whole stay of water. Now, why is God doing that? Because the children of Israel have turned away from the Lord. Because the children of Israel have turned away from the voice of the Lord. Because the children of Israel have turned away from the ways of the Lord. And they're going their own way. And God says, I'm going to judge you because you are going your own way. I'm going to take away the staff. I'm going to take away the bread from you. But then look what God says he's going to take away from them. I'm going to take away the mighty man. I'm going to take away the man of war, the judge, the prophet, and the prudent man, that's the wise man, and the ancient. I'm going to take away the captain of 50, and the honorable man, and the counselor, that's the one who solves problems, and the cunning artificer, and the eloquent orator. I'm going to take them all away from you. 
Why? Because Israel turned away from the Lord. And Israel turned away from the voice of the Lord. And Israel turned away from the ways of the Lord. And God says, I'm going to judge you. And the way I'm going to judge you is I'm going to draw back all of these blessed gifts. You take all of that out of a nation. You take all of that out of a church. You don't have much left. And I'm telling you, we don't have much left in this land anymore. We don't. But it doesn't stop there. He goes on. And I will give children to be their princes. And babes shall rule over them. Boys. <clears throat> and the people shall be oppressed. Every one by another. And every one by his neighbor. The child shall behave himself proudly against the ancient. Sound like America? And the base against the honorable. God goes on to say. When a man shall take hold of his brother, of his house, of his father, and say, Thou hast clothing, be thou our ruler, and let us, and let this ruin be under thy hand. In that day shall he swear, saying, I will not be an healer, for in my house is neither bread nor clothing. Make me not a ruler of the people. In other words, I don't want to be a leader. You be the leader. No, I don't want to be the leader. You be the leader. No, 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 I don't want to be the leader. You be the leader. Nobody wants to be the leader. Sound familiar? I tell you what, it's very familiar. It's very familiar. I know of men and whole families and churches who weep when a man is ordained to the ministry because the poor guy is now stuck. He's ordained to the ministry. That's heresy. That's heresy. What an honor. What a blessed privilege to get to be in the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ and preach the word of God to the people. But I'm telling you, there's a lot of ministers who weep when they get selected to be the minister. Oh, no. Woe is me. Yeah, I'm going to have to stay up late and I'll have to go to meetings. I'm going to have to preach so often and have to, have to, have to. I was sitting in a Sunday afternoon uh, past the ball Sunday afternoon meeting some time ago where there was about five men sitting there and it was Sunday afternoon and there was a Sunday evening service coming and they were trying to decide who's going to have the devotions and the one said well brother brother so-and-so you have the devotions and he threw the ball over to him and brother so-and-so he took the ball and said no really probably brother so-and-so would do a better job than I would and Brother so-and-so caught the ball and said, I really haven't had any time to study. I think brother so-and-so ought to do it. And he caught the ball and said, really, I don't think I would have much to say. Why don't brother so-and-so do it? And the ball went back and forth like this for about 10 minutes. Finally, they, they all wrestled one of them down and one of them agreed to do it. And I'm sitting there and you know, I'm who I am and I love to preach. Bless God. I love to preach. And I'm sitting there, and I didn't say anything because it wasn't lawful for me to preach in that place. But inside my heart, I was saying, throw me the ball, bless God. I'll have devotions tonight. You throw the ball over to me. I'm not throwing it to anybody else. What's wrong? I don't want to be the leader. I don't want to be the leader. I tell you why nobody wants to be the leader. Because they don't have the spirit of the living God burning inside of them, brethren. And many times it's the same way in our own homes. We need the spirit of the living God to be brooding over us. <clears throat> when men turn away from God's ways, God judges them and takes away their power, their authority, their wisdom, their stability, and everything else that could do anything good among them. Children turn against their fathers. Authority gets distorted Leadership is lacking. And the women step in. And the women step in then. Oh, how many times I read the letters. How many times I hear the ladies saying these words. And these are good ladies. You know, their letters are like this. Or their words go like this. Brother Denny, how do you feel about a wife having devotions in their home 
My husband won't have devotion. He, he's a good man. He takes care of us. He, he, he takes care of our needs. We have a house to live in, but he, he doesn't have devotions. But he doesn't mind if I have them as long as I'm careful. What do you think? Should I have devotions or what should I do? She, I get these questions all the time. You know, and here's this lady trying to be a hidden woman and find out how in the world she's going to take care of these children that are growing up and the days are turning into weeks and months very fast and there's no input, no spiritual input in their life and she's trying to figure out how she can be this hidden woman that she heard on this tape and still honor her husband and yet take care of the children. I weep for those ladies. I think, come on, man, you need a kick in the pants. Wake up to your responsibilities. Where are the men? Our forefathers have failed, brethren. I want to acknowledge that. I know we're sitting here. We stutter around and we stumble around in this whole thing of leadership. I know that. Our forefathers have failed. We are... Many of us in this room were two generations away from anything that could ever be called leadership. I know that. But we cannot sit on that and say, that's my excuse. I'm just going to let it happen for another generation. Somebody needs to rise up and change the whole picture so that the next generation, that's those boys that are sitting next to you tonight, that generation will rise up in a way that you never did and lead their homes and lead the church where it needs to go. We have got to do that. Now there are no leaders or very few. Women cry to me. They cry to me. How can I help my husband be a spiritual leader? He's a provider. He takes care of the home. He pays the bills. But he has no spiritual interest to lead our family at all. How can I help my husband? And you know, I tell her the right things. But something just bothers me on the inside to keep telling her the right things. When the guy won't wake up to his responsibilities. Something just troubles me inside. <clears throat> Who will rise up and put a stop to this terrible condition, brothers? Who will do it? That is the question that I put before you. <clears throat> Remember the father in the Jewish home? Remember the picture there? I mean, was he a leader or what? Sabbath evening, off to the synagogue, families preparing at home. He comes home, the children line up. He lays his hands on them. He blesses them. He teaches them the Bible. He teaches those little children how to read. He teaches them the Bible, helps them to memorize it, puts verses and songs and hymns in their, in their little hearts, makes sure that his sons have a right place to go to school. All those things. I mean, that man was a leader. <clears throat> God is calling you, brethren, to rise up and accept the challenge. The, the challenge of the hour is a challenge for leadership in the home. I'm telling you, that is the challenge of the hour. And I believe when finally these men start rising up to that challenge and consistently lead their homes... In two or three years' time, there will emerge more leaders than all of these churches know what to do with. The reason why we can't find leaders, we have so many little fellowships who would love to have a leader. The reason why we can't find any leaders is because there are not leaders in the homes. Bottom line, there are not leaders in the homes. Because there are not leaders in the homes... There can be no leaders in the church. And because there is no leaders in the church, we are in a sad, sad state of affair. <clears throat> God's will is for you to be spiritually mature men, wise financial managers, gentle, loving husbands, wise 
fathers guiding your children on a consistent basis that they enjoy and sense your overseeing canopy of love and care and protection over their lives. It is God's will for that to happen. That, my dear brethren, is a dynamic leader right there. That is a dynamic leader. <clears throat> Filled with the power of the Holy Ghost and the power of a godly life, you will not stop a man like that. Amen. Turn with me to Genesis 18, if you will. <clears throat> oh, I like Abraham. Amen. He was a leader. Genesis 18, 18, God says these words. <clears throat> he's deliberating whether he should tell Abraham what he's going to do with Sodom and Gomorrah. <clears throat> and he says these words. The Lord God said, Shall I hide, this is verse 17, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. Wow. What a statement. And God is saying, should I hide this thing I do from a man like this, since he's going to become all of these things, and all these things are going to happen through him? Now, if you just leave that verse all by yourself, that you just go away saying, hey, that's wonderful. And uh, the Calvinists would love that verse. Yeah, he was elected to be all of that. But the next verse shows us a bit more than that. And God begins to share with us in these words what he knows about this man Abraham. What he knows about Abraham. He goes on to say, For I know him. Glory. Glory. I know him. And I know that he will command his children and his household after him. Amen. And they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. Do you see that? That's beautiful. I love Abraham, that old man of God. God had it real clear right there. God said, I know this man, Abraham. I know what's in his heart. He doesn't have any boy yet. He doesn't have any children to take care of. But I know Abraham, and I know what Abraham is going to do because I know what's in Abraham's heart, and Abraham will command his children after him. Notice that word. That's none of this, hey, uh, maybe. Maybe could you, could you maybe sort of kind of try to, would you do this please? No, this man is a leader. He commands with spiritual authority his household after him and after the Lord. Beautiful. I like Abraham. So much so God sees into his heart. So much so that God says, so that I can do that which I prophesied that I would do through this man. So you see, it's not just God sitting up there saying, oh, I'm going to move the pawns around on the chessboard. You're going to go over here and be a failure, and you're going to go over here and be a success. No way! God gives the principles. God gives the grace. God gives the promises and says, Who will rise to the challenge? And those who rise to the challenge, they prosper in the ways of God. Their families prosper. Their children and their wives prosper like a beautiful sun shining on the grass after a rain in the middle of the night. Hallelujah. That's what God says. Let us do what we have to do, men, in order to be these kind of leaders. I don't know what you have to do. That I don't know. I don't know all you men. I don't know what you brought with you. I don't know what you're going back to. I don't know what's inside your heart. I'm not God. I can't see in there. I don't know if you'll pitch the whole thing in two weeks and just say those were nice meetings up there or whether your whole life will absolutely be redirected from this day forward. I don't know. 
Some of you may need to change your priorities. Maybe that's the only thing that's wrong. Maybe your heart is clear, but you're just too busy doing other things. And there's no time to get up in the morning and get alone with God and get a fresh touch from heaven out of His Word by His Spirit. Maybe that's the priority that you need to change. Maybe you're just plain got sin in your life. And you're sitting here holding on to something that you're not going to get rid of. I'm telling you, you need to get right with God if that's the way it is. You're hindering your whole family from prospering because you are choosing to live in sin instead of the grace of God. You know what it is. Most of the time in our lives, it's not a whole bunch of things. It's just one thing. Just one thing, brethren. Just one thing, usually. And it doesn't have to be a big thing either. Just one thing between my soul and the Savior hinders the flow of the grace of God in my life. Just one thing between my soul and the Savior hinders God's grace from working in my family's life. Just one thing. Maybe you need to sell out to God. Maybe that's what you need. Maybe you need an old-fashioned altar that you can just sell out to God there and say, okay, God, this is it. From here forth, I die. I die. And you will have your will and your way in my heart, in my life. And maybe you need to get born again. That's a possibility too. You know, the message that I gave way back at the beginning, it's pretty hard to do all of this. And not have the grace of God inside of you because you don't have a new heart yet. It's pretty difficult to do it. And it's very possible that as you're sitting through all of these meetings, by now you're coming to the stark reality that you don't have what it takes to do it. Maybe you need to just be born again. Face it for whatever it is, for the sake of your family, for the glory of God. Face the fact face the reality, deal with it, and go on. Where are the men? They're playing around with a bunch of other stuff when they ought to be seeking God. Where are the men? They're fooling around. They're wasting their time when they ought to be seeking God in the morning. That's where the men are. The men are not on fire for God because they have other things that are more important in their life. Once the meetings all settle down and everything cools down and everything comes back to normal, they have their own life that they're going to live. I'm telling you, brethren, those days are going to be over before you know it. They're going to be over. And I'm one who says we need to do what we need to do before those days are over. I mean, persecution is going to come to this land and straighten up all of us men real fast. How about if you just get ready ahead of time? Amen. Amen. How about you just get ready ahead of time? That's my plea to you this evening. That's my plea to you. Whoever you are, I do not know who you are.